Hello everyone, I think it's time to start. I think it's one thing to come along to a conference and give a presentation in your area of expertise. I think it's another thing to be a good sport and take part in a debate. You might even be on the side that you don't believe in. So I'd like to start by giving a great big round of applause to four good sports, I was gonna say sorts, yes, four good sports sitting on the stage. Get them warmed up. For the affirmative team, in the debate, the best way to get a social enterprise to scale is to start small and grow sustainably over time. So speaking to that proposition, will be first, Ian Learmont from Social Ventures Australia, and secondly, Steve Hawkins from the Benevolent Society. And disagreeing with that proposition will be first, Celia Hodson from the School for Social Entrepreneurs, and second, Paul Steele from the Difference Incubator. Now, it says in the program that I'm the adjudicator, but I'm actually the moderator. You're the adjudicators. I might make some comments on the way through because I sometimes can't help myself. Um, but you'll have to watch me for bias because um, I taught the first speaker of the affirmative team in 8C a long time ago. And everything that he's going to say, which is brilliant, will be down to his excellent foundations when he was this high and a little bright-eyed person. But my bias is even-handed because I also started some programs for the School for Social Entrepreneurs in London, and that's where Celia hails from too. So, what do you think? Do you have some existing preconceptions about scale? I mean, there are some assumptions that you always have to scale up. I find some of the MBA students that I sometimes teach have an expectation that things are only good if they go to scale. Um, is big always better? Let's hear what our four speakers have to say about this proposition. Speakers have got about five minutes each, and uh, if we've got time at the end, we'll allow some general comments as well. So thank you again very much, the four of you, for taking part in this. And Ian, you're first. Thank you, Cheryl, for that warm introduction. Um, Cheryl was then, of course, Cheryl Young was, was her, of course, maiden name. We both were young in those days. And if you're thinking 8C was like the bottom class, we went down to the G, I think. Oh, yeah, no, yeah, three no. Top you were in the top three I did, I wasn't looking for that. I think that the, when I think about an argument or a debate around social enterprise and scale and what social enterprises are wanting to achieve, I, I guess I was very starkly reminded of it, uh, in fact, on the way here. You know, I saw a guy on Elizabeth Street, big issue guy with his one magazine. I'm sure he had some more, um, but he certainly seemed to have one in his hand. Uh, I see the enterprises outside, and, you know, we have got a shoe cleaning business. There's, there's toilet paper for sale, ethically uh, created. We've got lanyards with, with bead necklaces made by a small group of people in the Philippines. Um, and it's, it's very much the think global, act local social enterprise. Um, I know I'm borrowing that from the environmental movement, but it's, I think it rings very true with, with what's being achieved and why it makes sense um, at a grassroots level. And, and that's because at the end of the day, people uh, who are social entrepreneurs wanting uh, to create a business are wanting to do that because they want it to address something, some form of disadvantage, some irretractable uh, social issue. And to do that is almost impossible uh, at day one uh, in multi-hundred million dollar scale. Uh, and we're going to talk a bit of various reasons about that. But as I say, at, at the sort of nerve centre or the DNA of the social entrepreneur is dealing with some particular social issue. And to do that, I think, you know, you want to start or almost need to start at a community level. And all those examples uh, that I've made are, are, are absolutely that. Um, 
Why is that? Well, um, as I say, there's the cultural aspect. There's also the very practical element of funding. Um, you know, raising vast amounts of money for a social enterprise uh, is an incredibly difficult thing to do. It's hard enough raising money for uh, a ruthlessly for-profit organisation, and I speak for experience there, um, but, but a social enterprise uh, often can, can be an employment-driven one, so you might be hiring pe people from a partic particular demographic, you might be wanting to sell products that are untested, you might want to operate in markets that are very difficult, um, people putting money into those sorts of high-risk propositions are by definition going to be cautious. Um, so you have, to start, you have to start small. You have to find uh, a philanthropist. You might have to find a friendly high net worth uh, family member or knock on a government door. Now, uh, you know, the... the the generosity of government towards social enterprise is, um, you know, I mean, I think it's headline grabbing as far as they see it, but when you look at the practical implications, once again, the numbers are very small. The West Australians, of course, made a, a big noise about the $10 million that they were granting to social enterprises, but, you know, when you break it down, and we were fortunate to be um, part of the consortium that were filtering through all the enterprises of the West, uh, some of the biggest advances there were, were some, you know, two, three hundred thousand dollars. Okay, so it's still small money. And then the Commonwealth government says we've got to make social enterprises bigger and bolder. Let's let's start the set of program, which I know many of you are aware of, where they found three fund managers to lend or invest money with social enterprises, and we um, were fortunate to be one of those fund managers. That's $20 million matched with private funding. So in theory, $40 million to allow people to be of scale, but when you look at what's taken place, um, each of the funds, which are you know 8.7, that's us, Foresters are 12, and the CIFA guys are, are 20, the loans there, uh, all under a million dollars. You know, they're still small. It's hard to raise lots of uh, bit, large, large licks of money. And, and the sort of things that we've done, you know, we've lent to, for, uh, to establish a small GP practice in uh, North Fitzroy. Um, so, you know, once again, community-driven, small program. We're happy to take a risk on a startup venture uh, under the guise of, of a bigger non-profit group called North Yarra Community Health, small, um, the last thing we did was, was lend a guy in Melbourne $200,000 uh, to support his Lego or brick-based social enterprise that worked with children with, with behavioural difficulties such as autism. Once again, small, um, community-based, focused, a distinct cultural so social mission, uh, but small and the only way to do it. I guess the other area which which challenges the social enterprise and the notion that you've got to get big in, big early and in, in, a, in with scale, is the resources, the human resources with it all. Um, it, you know, a, a, as I mentioned, many social enterprises are about providing employment opportunities to people and once again quite focused. You know, we've seen enterprises that are, that are as niches African, African asylum seekers in the west of Sydney. Um, so you've got to be small to do that. If you're going to achieve your mission, you, you can't offer uh, employment opportunities for hundreds of people. You might only have 20 or 30 people that are relevant to your business in that case, your social business. And, and looking beyond that, the infrastructure that you have to attract around a social enterprise, the IT, the HR, the marketing, the comms, all that stuff, which, of course, everyone, uh, the philanthropists and the government are all loath to fund. They only want to see the good stuff. They don't like the dull stuff. Um, I say that being part of a lot of that at SVA myself. But um, uh, that's, that's expensive and hard and, and resources are scarce. You've got to compete with the for-profit world to hire in uh, a good IT person, a good accountant, and I think that challenges social enterprise. Um, and, and ultimately, management skills are something that, that we, you know, we are also, uh, I think, 
are looking for greater depth and, and experience and a broader range of, of management skills. And I think social enterprise has been challenged with trying to attract that. I mean, there's obviously an inspired entrepreneur at the helm uh, and they build out a, bit, a social enterprise beneath them. But then as they develop more, they have to introduce more mainstream management skills. And I think once again, you've got to compete for a, a general manager right up against um, you know, against the, the, the conventional ones, because even though, uh, you know, a young general manager that could be terrifically useful to you would love to work in a social enterprise, they have all their other constraints. Then they've got to pay for the mortgage and, and, and whatever else. So, so you've, you've got to have a business that's really, really attractive. And I, and I think it's a scarce resource to find. So, um, you know, that, they were sort of the headlines that, that we, uh, Steve and I as a team, were, were looking to to present um, to you. Uh, social enterprise, it's about uh, you know, local engagement, a community uh, sector, making a difference, I think, at the community level. And for the various constraints I mentioned, uh, it's difficult to go in big and hard early. Uh, you don't, you know, the money is an issue. I think the, um, you know, getting the actual uh, infrastructure around you is an issue. Uh, and I don't think it's what, what social enterprise is about. I think it can gradually grow and expand, and I think there are terrific examples of a growing social enterprise. Uh, for example, uh, Street is one, and you know the, uh, uh, the private sector person would look at Street and say, uh, those guys are small, whereas we would say uh, here, they're, um, you know, they're vast on the scale of things um, because they've got more than two operations. So um, it's about keeping it real, and um, I, you know, I very much look forward to the uh, opposing views to see whether or not uh, we could at all be convinced of going in big early. Um, but otherwise, uh, look, thank you for your patience. Look forward to seeing uh, more small grassroots social enterprises uh, flourishing uh, under, um, under the wing of, of this particular conference. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. I wouldn't worry about borrowing from the environment movement with your um, think global, act local line because um, it's the same shared wisdom and uh, actually social's the new green these days. We're all in it together. So, was he a bit risk averse as an investor with an investor's hat on? <laughs> Let's hear what Celia has to say uh, opposing the proposition. <laughs> okay, I think um, Ian did a really good job at selling it large there. Thank you, Ian. I think that was really good. Um, so, does size matter? Oh, girl on an all male panel. I think that's an interesting one. So, you know, I'm not saying that it's bad to start with something very small and then spend time coaxing it along. But if growth isn't evident, speedy and sustainable, you may, it may well leave you feeling rather un, uh, unfulfilled, unsatisfied and frustrated and looking elsewhere for a more engaging opportunity, ladies. <laughs> so I dare say that Mission Australia and Vinnie's and the Red Cross, uh, you know, all started small and I wonder if they had the opportunity to, to think about that again. Um, knowing what they know now, how, more, how uh, much more quickly could they have moved to a backable, investable uh, state and reporting on a greater return on investment? So if they set up again with scale at the forefront, what a different organisation it potentially could be. So bigger startup social enterprises are better, and I'll tell you why. Um, they tend to generate profit on their activities at a very early stage. Bigger social enterprise prizes create uh, more shared value for their investors, and we are all looking for scale, aren't we, investors? Uh, ongoing employment, as Ian quite rightly said, is, uh, you know, rather than short-term and traditional uh, uh, employment, you know, it reduces knowledge drain by keeping talent in the organisation and uh, you know it's very difficult for small social enterprises to to make, uh, retain their talent and also importantly um, you know 
uh, larger social enterprises are able to offer a more diverse set of services to their customer base, and they're able to flex as their customers' needs change. So bigger social enterprises, in my view, are actually bigger for everyone. There's a reason why Macca's ask you if you'd like to go large with that. <laughs> Quantity of scale um, increases profit on a much smaller percentage of investment. You know, and hey, if we all look hugely overweight, and, or some folks from a marginalised group, uh, you know, get hurt because the social enterprise goes bust. Well, you know, that's sometimes the way life rolls. Hey, um, you can't win them all, and um, you know, I'm thinking that's the way the cookie. Or if you're running um, an organisation like Emir's, that's the way the box of locally sourced vegetables sold to a family at a local at a, an affordable price. That's the way that one crumbles. So social enterprises create more uh, more measurable uh, social value. Um, Organisations set up with the intention of employing more than 10 people from the, from the offset have a greater chance of maintaining their talent, observing their colleagues as role models, more opportunities for career development and progression. And entrepreneurs that are, have a uh, profit-driven culture may miss out a little bit on some of that aligned values, but you know what's with all that soft and fluffy stuff anyway? Big social enterprises are more sustainable uh, run a more sustainable environment and social enterprises that create the greatest social value from the outset tend to be receiving higher levels of investment. Ian's absolutely right. Larger funders are looking for larger deals. Uh, they have an opportunity to look for self-funding commercial opportunities, uh, government contracts, philanthropic things and in my book uh, a social enterprise that can take a 200,000 investment is not small, that's significant. Um, so let's just think about uh, shared value for a moment. If we're going to encourage bigger donors and investments to give to social ventures, we need to be aware that they're seeking, um, they're actually seeking out organisations that are able to demonstrate how they'll deliver that marriage of mission and management from the outset. Operating under very lean business models and the ability to report transparently on their outcomes is unfortunately not something that's a high priority for startup social enterprises who are not considering moving quickly. So um, as I'm on track here, and I think I'm already wiping the floor with Ian, um, I'd like to take a few seconds to recognise the amazing startup social enterprises from the School for Social Entrepreneurs and many others that have grown sustainably through support and nurturing um, over years in Australia. So small social entrepreneurs, can I have a hell yes? Hell yes, thank you. Okay, just giving you that one. So back to it. Research confirms that while investing in, uh, in small startups, uh, they can uh, add value. So seven out of 10 investors in, and corporate funders are keen to create social impact by investing in high growth social enterprise models. Uh, which could be profitable from an early stage. They're also moving to a lesser number of partners with a higher level of investment. And that all important staff engagement that we hear so much about. So from this we can see that becoming, it's becoming increasingly difficult for small enterprises to manage the tension between ego and logo and find the desired outcome of blurring those boundaries between corporate and community, whilst not suffering from mission drift, of course. So to sum up, gentlemen, size does matter. It matters from the outset, and you only have two options. I'll blush when I say this, I'm sorry. To go wide and, and very narrow, offering bells and whistles and bows and all manner of bedroom gymnastics, as a, offer, um, as a distraction to a very poor performance, or the more fulfilling option, which start with a sturdy, large model, then go narrow and deep. This, in my opinion, is the only way to hit the startup G spot. Oh, Celia. <laughs> Thanks to the one girl on the panel for taking that approach. Raising the perennial does size matter in a really, really different way. I've never heard it applied to social enterprise before. 
So, now it's getting confusing, isn't it? We've had two persuasive cases. What have you got to say next about that, Steve? Good morning. Well, I think this panel is explaining why a gradual approach succeeds its in its achievement by the fact that this also my position here right now started with Sandy ringing me saying, oh, we've got this social marketplace, would you come and speak? I then find out I'm on a panel moderated by Cheryl Kerno. I then find out that my guest speaker, who I assumed is a bit of a num numbskull investment banker like myself, was actually taught in debating by Cheryl. <laughs> I now have the opposition alluding to the startup G-spot and I am supposed to hold my own in this. So for the record, I didn't have Cheryl Young, I think the name was, as my teacher. I, in fact, was thrown out of the Year 8 debating team. And uh, most people who observed that decision have highly commended the teacher who was responsible for my elimination from the team. So I'll do my best here, but I'm really hoping for the sympathy vote, to be quite frank. Um, I think the challenge here, and it does get to a bit of an ec economic, there's some definitional uh, issues here and there are some assumptions. Firstly, I think we've had a bit of a challenge with the definitional issue, and once again, Ian and I might be a little biased, but when I was asked you know, about a scaled social enterprise, I don't think of a $200,000 uh, enterprise, so I'm not really referring to that. Um, you can do the maths with the wages in Australia at the moment, but a $200,000 a year social enterprise does not employ that many people, almost independent of what percentage of the... Uh, national uh, of the average wages they're on. So I'm thinking of something, when I think of scale, I do think of something well beyond that, uh, I would think in the millions. So I would be arguing here that definitionally, if we're talking about something that's scalable, if you're talking about something that attracts significant investment, we do need to be talking millions, not arguing that um, something which I, I fully approve, that something goes from start that's $200,000 a year, that is an amazing achievement. I'm not saying it's not. But I think when we talk about scale, I think we need to address what we mean. And then we have talked a little bit about this big is better, this idea that just because something works in one way and is very passionate, the idea that, that you can scale that and keep the passion, I think is somewhat of a false assumption. And I think it is, a, it is that why two arguments can sound like they're both convincing is I think one glossed over the very harsh reality of taking something small, focused, and is achieving something very special and just assuming that it can get bigger and that that's easy, and uh, pat particularly in this sector. Um, and I think, unfortunately, you know, there are things where, where you know, we say um, uh, that uh, the road to ruin is paved with good intentions. So often we take somebody who's talented and passionate and just assume that, that what they're doing can catch fire and, uh, you know, I think uh, there's a number of investment bankers coming into this sector and everybody says, what's going on there? I, it is, does remind me of the story and it might relate to small social enterprises. But I think uh, somebody once said the way to uh, put successfully get somebody, uh, an investment banker in charge of a small business was to give them a large one and watch. <laughs> so I think Ian started with the point, what's wrong with staying small and focused and, and the hell yes that we got before sort of indicated how do you keep that passion what's wrong what is this thing about needing to be big and get scale and one of the things that happens in the private sector and why people want scale is they want to list on stock markets they want access to international capital markets that is a false maxim here what we have observed here is we have a small amount of money that is available to fund these enterprises and if you go too big and you go through your cash flow then the alternate sources of funding are, yet, are not yet developed. So the risks are very different from a private sector enterprise in terms of the access to cash flow you can get from being big. Um, and, and uh, you know, there was talk about, oh, well, uh, larger scale social enterprises, will they become to profit more quickly, they can, they can get going quickly. That's not, I'm not sure what, textbook or study that comes from, I'm afraid, Celia, because I have never, I have seen no evidence that just because you, starting things is hard. I've seen no evidence whatsoever that ever, ever that starting things big creates any less challenges than starting things small. The problem when you start things big 
is that when you run out of money, it's gone, and the sources available, as Ian was alluding to, are, are not there. Um, in the banking world, they say that uh, the market can stay wrong longer than you can stay liquid. So you may have the best idea in the world, but if nobody's going to fund it and you've run out of money, it's kind of the end of it. The second thing we talk about, once again, is these economies, so-called economies of scope and scale. Arguably, the Benevolent Society is one of the largest social enterprises in Australia. We've got 1,000 people. We've got a $100 million budget. We're completely for purpose. I can tell you, as being, as being a general manager of the Benevolent Society, every day I ask my question, what, myself the question, what are the economies of scale in this sector? Helping people is not like building bridges. You go build one bridge, you can point to that bridge and go, hey, there's a bridge, this is how you build it, works really well, and everyone can go, oh, okay, we'll build that bridge again next time. You have one group, one family in one area, you go to the next area, and that fam it's completely different. The ability to get consistent practice across our, across our services is incredibly challenging. If we are focusing on social markets, the evidence is very strong. If you've got a good idea and you're passionate and you can go into that local area, you can make a real difference. Your ability to scale that in the next suburb is, is very questionable. And as somebody who's got passion and a particular focus, I'm not really convinced about the need to go into this massive structure where all of a sudden you're dealing with HR and IT and management. So the Benevolent Society is a relatively large social enterprise in my mind. It's taken 200 years to get it to that size. Um, a lot of the things that are going for us are best are the tradition that we've developed in that. And accordingly, um, I, do, I think that it, you need to grow into these things and to rush them, as Ian points out, uh, severely mitigates you on two fronts. One is your ability to get funding, and secondly, these economies of scale aren't there, and indeed, I would argue in many instances, there's significant economies of, uh, diseconomies of scale. So for me, I will pick passion over the big is better movement. Um, I say to everybody here, grow at your own pace. Don't be talked into things, taking risks that you don't need to what you're doing. You know what's right. Grow slowly, grow effectively, and make sure that as you leap to the next stage that you do it carefully and not on the basis that there's economies of scale out there which are at best theoretically and probably theoretical and probably non-existent. Thank you. I wouldn't have thrown you out of that team, Steve. You did very well. So, passion over the big is a better movement. Let's hear the second speaker from the Big Is Better movement, Paul. I don't just want you to be big and find the G spot. I want you to think big. When it comes to social enterprise, all too often we end up with a self-fulfilling prophecy that somehow we need to stay small, stay connected to the grassroots and build something that will be sustainable over a very long period of time. But we sold ourselves a myth. What we're really on about is making a huge impact in Australia. We want a different community. We want a better world. We want families that are more connected, communities that operate better, and we want a planet that actually is sustainable. And if we think we can do that by a whole lot of little, small organisations, we're kidding ourselves. In the earlier session today, we talked about how much capital is there to do social good. And Danny, where are you? Danny, you told us there's $2.5 trillion available for investment in Australia today. That's now fact because you said it. <laughs> Why aren't we taking that $2.5 trillion and putting that to social good? We don't because we think small and we never find the G spot. I want to encourage you that if we think big, design big. We can scale organisations to be able to do things that we could not do otherwise. That's not to say there's not a place for the small, for the organically grown and for the grassroots movement. And in fact, they're great areas for innovation, for entrepreneurs and sometimes even produce large organisations. But that place is a place. And we need and we have an opportunity to build large, systemically changing organisations and social enterprises that can bring about impact in the world in new and unique ways. And we need this. How many of you are a social entrepreneur today 
who worries about how to meet payroll next week? How many of you worry about the HR and IT issues for your organisation? And yet, we heard Steve talk about the fact that he's in an organisation where he doesn't have to worry about those things, where those things are taken care because of the scale and the size of the organisation and allows him to focus on his mission, to bring about the impact that he wants to bring about because of that scale, because of the wonderful build-out of an organisation and not staying awake at night wondering whether he can pay himself and his employees tomorrow morning. Scale has advantage. Scale allows us to bring impact that sometimes is not possible in other ways. Why don't we have more of these? We don't have it because we don't think we can have it. But we do have good instances and good examples of what is scalable and rapidly scalable organisations. Sometimes we could buy an existing organisation, and Good Start was a great example. Very opportunistic, but at the same time a fabulous demonstration that we can start big. We can take something that has the potential of being profitable tomorrow and start to deliver social impact. Good Start was the purchase of the ABC Learning Centres, and really they weren't learning centres, they were babysitting centres. But with the purchase of the Good Start deal, they went from being our country's babysitting service to a true educational early learning situation. And that will have a radical impact on Australia more than just the individual kindergarten down the road. The fact that we've transformed hundreds of early learning centres now there actually teaching our kids and bringing a new generation out of babysitting into early learning and development has to have a mammoth impact in Australia. And that is not possible if we can't think big. We can and we should support entrepreneurs at the grassroots. But where are our corporate and organisational leaders who will build out the large impacting organisations to transform corporate Australia into the largest network of social enterprises on the planet? Where our banks are seen as socially minded? Where our insurance companies actually think about a people first approach? Where our energy generation is one of sustainability and stability in the way that we deliver it because we actually care about people. See, we can take large organisations and inject a really great social understanding and mission if we could just think about it. Steve mentioned that he only considers something at scale if it's in the millions of dollars. And yet, my colleague Ian mentioned Street as a great example. An organisation that intentionally was set up to scale, to intentionally grow as rapidly as possible and to realise that it needed to both from a financial but also from a social impact perspective. An organisation now turning over $3 million and will within the very soon future start to turn over 6 to $10 million a year. Is that large enough? It's a good start. One from 100,000. Yep. <laughs> the fact that we don't have them doesn't mean that we shouldn't have them and it also doesn't mean that it's not the right way for us to develop and put into the Australian context the kind of impact that we know we need. Big hell yes for the small enterprise. But a big why not for the big end of town. Oh, I'm glad I'm not making the decision. So you have to. I'm going to give you about a couple of minutes to talk about it at your table. But I want you to leave behind the starting prejudice you might have had based on everything you've observed or heard or whatever. And I want you to think about the cases that were made because this is a debate. It's not a popularity contest or a sense of humour contest. <laughs> Thank you for making it humorous, though. We do appreciate that. But in the end, um, we're going to cast a vote in a minute, so just have a chat amongst yourselves, and then we'll come back and have a show of hands.
Okay, um, that's enough time. I'm going to ask you to <laughs> I'm going to ask you to indicate by a boisterously accompanied show of hands. So noise matters too. Those who want to award to the debate to the affirmative, please raise your hands and make a noise. Oh, the affirmative. You don't forget this team here. Oh, come on, a few more. This team here is the affirmative, and they argue that the best way to get a social enterprise to scale is to start small. They talked about the funding and resources needs and being connected with your local community. That's the affirmative in favour of the proposition and those who were opposing the proposition. Well, they, we had lots of G-spots, didn't we, in this debate for once, but they, they talked about um, we really need to get serious about making a huge impact on the intractable problems we have and if we're thinking about a whole planet, there's no point in just confining it to lots of small organisations. Is that fair summary? <laughs> so. This is the affirmative in favour of starting small and growing, and this is the big picture, big impact side in the opposition. So let's hear it again. Those who would award the debate to the affirmative, please raise your hands and accompany it with some noise. Oh, Lord. Sandy, can you help me? Make, let's see what we get here. Oh, you feel better now? That's good. And those who want to award it to the opposition, <laughs> oh, there you go. Ooh, just a slight, a slight um, win in favour of the opposition. Thank you very much for being here and a big hand to our debaters.